I would like to welcome all of you to the American Rocketry Challenges March Ask an Engineer webinar brought to you by Northrop Grumman. My name is Jeremy Davis, and I am your host tonight and the program manager for the American Rocketry Challenge. And with me here this evening is Mike Fuller. Uh, Mike is an engineer with Northrop Grumman. He's been there for over 15 years now. He currently works in business development, and he's responsible for their NASA programs, which includes their, the SLS booster. Mike has presented Mars mission architecture studies and discussed deep space exploration at conferences and events, both nationally and internationally. Uh, and previously, he worked for seven years in research and design on thermal protection systems and ultra high temperature materials. Mike got his bachelor's degree in ceramic engineering and his master's in material science and engineering from The Ohio State University. Mike, so glad to have you with us. Glad to be here. I appreciate your uh, invite me here and give me a chance to uh, spend some time with everybody. I'm looking forward to it and excited to uh, to see how things uh, progress tonight. Should be fun. Absolutely. I'm excited to see all the questions. And so just a reminder for everyone, use the Q&A feature in the chat and feel free to start sending your questions in now as we do our introductions. So, uh, Mike, you had a video we wanted to uh, share with everyone. Yeah. Just to get started, you uh, before I go ahead and share, you want to tell everyone what they're going to be watching? Yeah, so I'm going to show you a little video about um, the SLS booster and specifically some of the projects I worked on. Um, when this uh, video shows up, it's going to be a static test of what we called our QM2 static test occurred about four years ago. Um, but what was really cool about it is we actually tested some, some new materials on it and some new uh, video techniques. So I actually helped as, as we start this up, you're going to see, be looking down the, uh, the nozzle of the SLS booster, and you're going to see a little red piece. And as it breaks apart is when it's starting up. And this is the, basically the, uh, the motor igniting and the flame coming down. And what you're seeing here is basically the, that foam breaking apart and moving out away from the, uh, the booster. That foam was there to basically protect the inside of the propellant from um, the ambient environment in, down, at, uh, down at Florida. So one of the other things we actually did, we do a lot of high speed video in this so we can actually see what's going on during the whole uh, process. And part of what we were doing, we actually tested uh, a new, vi uh, oh, this, you're actually seeing it on top of the screen now, was what's called Hydrus X. So it was a, a, a high fidelity, high definition, uh, high speed video that was actually able to do, uh, to bring out a lot of the detail and contrast in the, um, in the plume so that you could actually see a lot of what was going on. Because the plume is so bright, it's really hard to, uh, to capture in high-speed video. And so this new camera was able to actually capture a lot of the details. You can see a lot of the stuff going on in there that you wouldn't normally be able to see. And so that was, a, I actually helped uh, coordinate with the uh, NASA folks down at uh, Stena Space Center to get this up here to, uh, to actually be able to use on that test. So it was a really exciting time. No, and that's really tremendous stuff there. I know being able to see inside the plume of the rocket engine during the test, you know, that that's some really incredible and valuable knowledge for the fluid dynamics and mechanics of, you know, what's going on with that exhaust that's propelling mm -hmm. us uh, to the moon and beyond. So anything else you want to say before we get into the questions? No, I think that was really the, the big thing. Um... I'm looking forward to uh, to answer some questions. So uh, I was told that there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of technically advanced questions from this group. So I'm excited to field them, fire away, and uh, we'll do our best to give you the uh, the straight shoot. If I can't answer it, I will let you know, and then we'll work with uh, Jeremy to get you an answer uh, <laughs> to those questions offline. Absolutely. And so really, no, he, he means it. I've spent about an hour or two talking with Mike ahead of this. If you want to ask some questions about, uh, about rocket motors and propellant, Mike's your guy tonight. So don't worry about, uh, don't worry about, you know, glazing over my eyes. He's the expert. <laughs> uh, but to get us started here, you know, one question that we got from a number of students was, you know, did you ever think you'd be working on NASA programs when you were getting a ceramics degree? You know, I had, you'd always hope. I mean, I, I was, I was that nerd in high school that was always involved with space. Uh, you and I talked about this previously and just always really wanted to be involved, but kind of 
as I was progressing in my degree, thought, no, nah, probably going to be, there's probably going to be another route for me that might not happen. Um, but we were talking before that I actually, I kind of ran into the job, I don't want to say accidentally, but um, whether you want to call it fate, destiny, whatever you want to call it, um, I had lost a job and was out, had put my resume out on, uh, on the internet and been looking and actually got a call from my current company. Well, at the time it was called ATK Thiokol. Uh, and they were looking for someone with my background to work on a variety of different programs some Air Force programs and looking for some NASA programs. So I, I jumped at the opportunity. I mean, it was just one of those things. It's like, of course, why wouldn't I want to take this job? This is going to be great. And 15 years, it's been, it's been a heck of a ride. A heck of a run indeed, 15 years running. There's a lot that's happened in the industry in that time. Yes, there is. Um, and sort of related to that and all the different experiences you've gotten from starting back then, you know, what's been one of the coolest experiences you've had because of your work? Well, I have to, this is, this is my geek out moment. Um, so it was, I was actually invited to go down to Kennedy Space Center to, to look at the uh, pad 39B, we were actually, they were having some problems in the shuttle program with um, the, basically the fire, the fire brick that they had on the side was falling off during the, uh, during the oh, shuttle no. launches. And so they were like, okay, we got to figure out how can we, how can we replace this? How can we make it better? And they said, come on down and take a look and see what you guys see. Well, the, the guy who was taking us on the tour took us down, showed us, and they had, the Space Shuttle Endeavor was actually on 39A. And so he's like, Hey, you guys got a minute? I'm like, yeah. He's like, hey, let's go over to thirty. Let's go over to Pad Thirty Nine A and take a pad <laughs> tour while the shuttle's on the. Uh, stand. Oh, you know, casual. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 inside I'm like, ah, this is gonna be great. But then, spaceship. So he, he takes us over and we walk up on the pad. We had full access pad. We actually walked up. I mean, walking past the orbiter wing, it's like, okay, I want to touch. I want to touch. I can't. I know this is not a good idea. And they took us underneath the shuttle and look at the engines. They took us up to the white room where the, uh, the astronauts go in. So you got to go up and you saw all of the, uh, all the signatures that are on the wall and you're looking and you can, they didn't have it open, but you could see the, uh, you could see in. One of the things that was actually really, really cool is when we were down by the wing, by the wing route, they actually had one of the doors open and were actually showing off the, they were doing some maintenance on the inside of the uh, shuttle. So you can actually see the liquid liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen feed lines coming into the engines. And they said, hey, why don't you go in and go take a look? And so I had these pads laid down and we actually crawled inside the orbiter and we're looking at the uh, some of the insides of the space shuttle endeavor. And so to me, that was the yeah, that was like the coolest fun. moment of uh, of my career. I actually got to see some play with and play in the uh, in the space shuttle. So that was, yeah, that was my that was the coolest moment. Absolutely. Oh, that's the kind of stuff that, you know there's no other way to get that kind of look in and it, it just means the world, especially when you've worked on those sorts of things for so long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, kind of related to, you know, getting the chance to look in and something, you know, the space shuttle is something we all know about conceptually. Uh, but a related question we have from going from concept to then seeing it in person and the mm -hmm. details there, uh, this is from Dominic, uh, from Whitney M. Young Magnet High School. You know, what are some of the problems that usually happen going from imagining a concept or a design to then building it in real life? Oh man, that's a tough question. So Dominic, you get you that was a, that's a good one. Um, to be honest, it it actually is taking translating the idea from I mean that concept that idea into something that's actually presentable and workable. So how do you get that into the, uh, into the, it, when I started, it was drawings, but now it's uh, 3D models of, they're actually extensible and then now you can play with them and see how they all fit together. And then seeing some of those unintended actions where, okay, this sounds like this great idea, but when you, when you actually put it in and get it to work, it has some knock on effect that you weren't expecting. And now you've got to either fix those or you go back and redesign what you had to actually make it work in a manner that doesn't interfere with something that you're, that you're working with. We had a couple of those on our, uh, I was actually a uh, thermal protection system lead on Aries and into, into SLS for the booster. And so we had a couple of those where NASA decided for cost savings, they were gonna re 
they're going to reduce the number of TPS materials we had. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But then we started putting stuff on and you're supposed to hand lay up some of these things. And we found out that it wasn't as easy to replace the one with another, even though conceptually it sounded simple. It's just, it's something you just kind of push in here and hand pat it down. It's but not Legos. One, yeah, no, one was more like sticky sand and the other one was more like sticky Play-Doh where it gets all over your hands and it's just harder to deal with. And you end up with, with material all over the place and now you're scraping it off and cleaning it up. And so it's just one thing where you're like, okay, this is a great idea. It's going to save time. It's going to save money. And it turns out, well, maybe not as much as we might have thought it was going to. Yeah. So. It's, it's one of those really difficult things where it's, you know, conceptually you think, oh, it'll just, it'll just fit. It'll just work. Mm -hmm. And then there are so many small details that go into not just rocket science, but everything that we work on, anything that's more than one person, mm -hmm. there are details that you don't know about. Right. Well, the, it, so there's another interesting one when we're talking about, so our space shuttle booster or the SLS booster, sorry. Uh, when we stack them, you're basically these big 12 foot diameter cylinders. And they've got the this section that you got a piece here like this and a piece that sticks over this so they all fit together just right let me see if i can get that right but so you have this 300,000 pound cylinder that's sitting over top of this other piece that's down and now you got to get it and the the tolerances are within four or five thousandths of an inch and you've got to get this thing to sit and then seat straight down so if it's not quite perfectly level or Sometimes when they, they, we transport them on their sides and then when we lift them up, take them up, they don't always relax back to cyl cylindrical. So you got to force it's it a little bit, give it a little shove. It's not all just perfect piece. Exactly. It's, so it's just a, some of those nuances where in theory it should work great. But then once you get it into practice, you got all these little, these little differences and you start seeing people breaking out the hammers and you're like, wait. No, you don't want to be using we're a hammer just, around. We're just hitting the booster with a hammer? No. <laughs> well, and you'd be surprised. It actually is. Sometimes it takes a hammer. Yeah, because <laughs> it, it just gets into you know just what happens when rubber meets the road. I'm sure all of the students in the audience uh, can definitely – uh, sympathize and get that feeling of going from building, you know, designing it and then even building it in their, uh, in their classrooms and taking it out to launch and then be like, Oh wait, the engine mount. That's not, that's not right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not uh, the way it was in the drawings we had. Oh. That wasn't how it was back in the classroom. What mm -hmm. happened? <laughs> but speaking of designs, we've got a question here from Micah Hall asking, you know, what programs are used for um, for designing? And then we have a, a similar question uh, from Andrea Torres asking about simulations for testing those designs. So a little two-parter here from Micah and Andrea about what sort of programs, and maybe not specific programs, but technologies that are used to design the rockets that you all work on. And then how do you simulate those designs before it goes to manufacturing? Okay, so I'm going to answer it in a, in a couple different ways. Um, for design, so we actually have, uh, we do all of our designs in, in 3D models. So we have uh, a 3D modeling program that we actually use to, to formulate the model and actually get it all to work together. That's, I, I believe right now we use CATIA. Um, it's similar to um, AutoCAD and there's all kinds of other programs that are very similar, but SolidWorks, the, all the like. But we, so we use that as our, as our basis for um, rendering the system and actually putting it together. Um, we actually have a number of other programs that are actually custom made internally that we use to help design the actual, the, uh, the thermal conditions, the structural conditions. So we actually go through and model those to verify that everything that we've designed actually can handle the, either the, the pressures, the loads, the temperatures, the chemical environment. Those are all modeled in, in various different computer simulations to verify that it does what it says it does. And then of course we actually have, um, we actually developed a, I was part of a, a team that actually developed a system where we actually, um, I guess I had to take a step back. So you guys, you guys are familiar with the way the grain design uh, or the propellant surface, inter, surface features actually influence the thrust trace. So we actually have a, uh, computer simulation that will actually optimize that grain design based on what kind of the thrust profile you need. So for, we're actually building a, a follow-on for the SLS booster called Bolay. 
and it is uh, doing some quick minute. math. <laughs> What's the, oh, hold on a second? I my computer died on, or actually uh, went to sleep for a second. So the uh, the bully booster, they came back and said we want a specific performance to mm -hmm. the moon, and we want a, this specific performance increase. So we knew what our, our constraints were. So we loaded them into this program and we actually ran somewhere in the neighborhood. I can't remember the exact number, but it was somewhere in the order of 80 or 90 million different optimizations to try to come up with the, the not optimal, but the best grain design that actually provided the best performance, but also the at the least impact to the overall vehicle. So those types of systems that we actually do code in-house to develop those, those types of uh, mm -hmm. uh, operations so that we can actually provide the customer what they need yeah and that's part of that secret sauce that makes the projects that northrop grumman works on different than other companies out there it's not mm -hmm. just the rockets themselves it's the technologies that get right. used to build those rockets and we're not just talking about technologies like friction stir welding or different mm -hmm. you know unique added methods of additive manufacture technologies like you're saying for simulation those are mm -hmm. you know very often unique and just for that company just for sometimes even just for that project Yes. So and it, it's actually interesting when you think about when they designed for the space shuttle, um, it was really a guy came there. I read one of the reports that they actually produced this. They actually came up with, this is what we want, that we think we want it to do. And then somebody came up with, a, they had what they called a stick trace where they kind of, they, they kind of put some uh, pieces down on a, on a graph paper. And then they ran the hand calcs to see if it actually did what they wanted to do. And so they did that two or three times and said, okay, that's, that's about where we want to be. And then they refined it from there. Whereas like with this, with this next generation booster, like I said, we went through 80, 90 million different iterations of various different um, grain designs, propellant formulations and the like, until we got to the one that NASA liked the best and we were able to basically push in and we're starting to actually do in full scale development. Yeah, that, uh, that advanced computer simulation lets you really hone in on that perfect option. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Um, now, shifting over to talk about teamwork and, and addressing these problems, you know, all of these all of these projects, you know, from model rockets to, you know, the full scale rockets that are going to take us back to the moon, you know, they all are worked on by teams of people. And so, what are um, when a problem occurs on a team you're leading? You know, how do you all work to uh, to resolve those issues? And I know that can depend a lot on what the issue is, but you know, let's talk about just in general. What are some of your approaches to conflict resolution when, on the teams that you lead? That's not a tough question at all. Um, I thought we were going to be technical. Want to go back to that technical question? Hey, that was from Andrew Yang in the chat. And so everybody right. else, everybody in the chat, feel free to throw technical questions well, here. That's good. No, actually, so Andrew, the, so it was actually, that's actually a really hard thing. And so interpersonal relationship, especially un, among engineers is, it's, it's hard without having thrown engineers on top of it. You throw engineers into it. Everybody thinks they're right. Everybody thinks that they have the right solution. And everybody thinks them. they checked their math enough times yes and, and invariably there's a problem in the math somewhere but really what it comes down to is uh, is bringing someone forward if someone's got a, a got a, a problem or a suggestion is bringing it up saying okay what what do you see as the problem and have them get, have them air their idea out so that we can actually work through it and either um see that it's a valid response or, or a valid answer and might actually help us in our in the uh, problem solving effort or that it's something that might be taking us down a road that we don't necessarily want to go down whether it be a complexity a cost or something along those lines and basically using using the team to kind of help work through the system and help that person see that they are either the, to realize that they're recognize them for the great job that they're doing for for bringing forth the uh, a potential answer or a potential problem, but also coming together and seeing working with the team to realize that's either yes, it's a good answer, or no, it's a it's an area that we don't want to necessarily address at this point. Yeah, it sounds like you know the number one thing there is is empathy and mm -hmm. and being able to hear when there's an issue on your team, be it with a technical disagreement, a personality disagreement, or anything. It's hearing out the other person entirely and so then hopefully when they realize you're listening they are saying it 
and realize, mm. oh, wait, that I get it. I get why this doesn't work now. Or right. you're able through hearing them out and, and really giving them that benefit, able to help them come to the place where, you know, OK, I get it. That's it's not that I'm wrong. It's that there's a priority difference. Right. And, and that's and that's the especially hard one when when the person has the right answer, but because of some other reason or some other some cost, some schedule, something along those lines, you can't necessarily implement it now is trying to mm -hmm. trying to recognize that, that, yes, we came up with a great idea and a great suggestion and we'd love to implement it. But because of the time, because of maybe schedule or cost or uh, customer preference, we can't necessarily entertain that. And we've just got to move forward with the, uh, with the current situation. Yeah. It's one of those things that it really is, you know, so difficult to, uh, to address those sorts of issues. If, um, if someone would have uh, told me when I was uh, going through engineering school that most of my work would have been in writing and interpersonal relationships, I would have laughed at them and said that there's no way I'm going to do a good job at it. It's the most but, important thing because you've got you have to work with other people. There's mm -hmm. no way around it. Yep. You know, that's that's how we make everything that all of us, you know, here to, you and I talking now and everyone in the audience, everything that we admire took a team. It takes a village. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it does. But in speaking about studying and engineering, you know, just a, a question here. The, the atten it's from an anonymous attendee, though I do remember seeing this in the advanced questions list. Um, how hard is it to get into the School of Engineering at a university? So just asking about college admissions and may, you know maybe help address you know for some of the students in the audience who are intimidated by the idea of getting into an engineering school you know maybe they're you know they're sitting there and oh gosh i didn't take ap calc or oh i i wasn't able to fit this that or the other am i really going to make it into a college of engineering well i, I i'm the, i'm, the, I'm one of those examples uh, i didn't take ap calc i didn't do those types of things but I went to a state school, I went to Ohio State. So um, again, it really depends on what engineering school you're gonna try to get into. If you're gonna try to get into a Stanford or someplace like that, that's gonna be a little more difficult than getting into maybe a, a Purdue or Ohio State or even some of the, uh, some other schools that may not necessarily be as highly regarded in engineering, but still gonna give you that engineering degree. Um, a lot of people think that you gotta be from one of half a dozen or a dozen top schools in engineering to to be able to make it in aerospace you don't i mean really what you need to do you need to get your engineering degree you need to have a relatively good gpa you need to come from an accredited school and but then just about there, every school you you're going to apply to in the united states is accredited it's going to be accredited and but then that really is the that's really it i mean there are some of the schools like north of Bremen in particular um tends to focus on there's probably six or eight schools that we really are focused schools, but we don't limit ourselves to them. We, we tend to look at a larger audience because we don't want to miss out on that exceptional student who might have graduated from, and this doesn't mean that they're not a great school, North Dakota State University, where maybe you didn't know they had a great mechanical engineering program, but there's, a guy, there's someone that went through that program who's actually really good. So, and, you know, maybe that student who is at North Dakota State University, maybe they spent two or three, maybe even four years competing in something called the American Rocketry Challenge. And That's they have true. literally years of hands-on experience well, working on mm -hmm. these sorts of projects. Well, and that, that's one of the other things I, I've actually gone out on a couple of recruiting trips where you actually, you talk to the people. And one of the things we like to look for is what are you doing outside of class? I mean, it's all well and good to be a, to get straight A's through school and have this this great transcript and you got your degree from a top school but if you can't translate the book learning into the actual physical and actually be able to play with it with your fingers there's there's something missing that that being able to take from the concept and go to your hands or something physical is important that actually is something we, we really look for and really value so here we'll actually put a finer point on it for everyone in the audience because this is something we say that I really want to make sure gets through before we get to our some more live questions. If you saw on someone on an on a an undergraduate student's resume, they're a senior, they're getting ready to graduate, they're applying for an entry level position. How much of a differentiator is seeing something like the American Rocketry Challenge and NASA Student Launch on their resume? 
Well, that's going to be, they're going to garner a lot more attention just because you know, they've already, they're already into that kind of, um, they understand, they've worked with it. They've gone through some of the, especially with um, American Rocketry Association with the, uh, or American Rocketry Challenge, sorry. Don't. Uh, and <laughs> National the, Association of Rocketry. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. And the, uh, and the student launch competition, those are very rigorous. And so there's a, there's a, a specific format you have to go through to get to uh, the end state. And knowing that you've gone through that, tells us that you've already been partially trained and you know kind of you're not going to come to us and go what do you mean uh i got a flight readiness review or what do you mean what do you we're mean going we to... have to change it for a different design parameter right or the, the i any of these design reviews that you go through that it's a part of every design process those are things that you see in these in these competitions that you wouldn't otherwise normally go through and have to uh, have to deal with so those are big and it makes a it makes a big difference and it actually will compensate for a little lower GPA seeing somebody that has that type of experience is going to give them a leg up. Absolutely. So too long, didn't listen. The work you're doing right now is a huge differentiator and mm -hmm. it makes all the difference, not just for getting into a college of engineering, but for when you're done with college, when you've got your degree and you're getting ready to apply for jobs. So mm -hmm. the work you're already doing right now is tremendously important. Um, and also I, I personally came to the hard sciences later on in my undergraduate career. So even if you start undergrad and you didn't get into the college of engineering, you can still get into it after you start. Mm -hmm. So don't be intimidated by any of these doors. There's always a way forward and the experience you're getting now makes such a huge difference. Um, and just a quick reminder for a few people that have joined late, um, this webinar is ch a chance to ask Mike Fuller here about all things aerospace and rocketry. So <laughs> let's um, save the questions specifically about the competition for emails to me or another Q&A we might do with my counterpart at the National Association of Rocketry, Trip Barber. For now, let's get down to the hard rocket science. And we've got a question here that is uh, right up your alley uh, oh. from Heath. What is the maximum stable temperature that we can reach with materials uh, science right now? Uh, without having to worry about oxidation or reduction or decomposition that causes the material to fail under load? Wow, good question. So actually, and you're, you, as Jeremy alluded to, I'm, I'm actually, that's right up my alley. I actually worked on uh, um, a program when I started, uh, I started it out here at uh, North of Grumman that uh, we were looking at ultra high temperature materials for that very purpose. How high a temperature can you take them um, how can you make them work in an oxidative environment and hold up to the, both the thermal as well as the mechanical loads. So right now, the, the kind of the peak uh, um, temperatures we use in, in solid rocket motors, uh, the flame temperatures are anywhere between, um, SLS is actually a relatively low temperature propellant at about 5,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and, and that's why I say relatively, <laughs> relatively, you know, and it goes up to some of the really high performance propellants that we have can approach temperatures close to 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So typically most of the materials we actually use, use some sort of a carbon based material, a carbon composite of either, we call them either carbon phenolics, which is a carbon fiber with a, uh, phenolic resin built in that actually, um, ablates or erodes at a relatively constant rate or we use what we call a carbon-carbon ITE, so a carbon-carbon composite, which is a carbon fiber with a carbon matrix built into it. And that can actually stand temperatures well into the 7,000 degree Fahrenheit range. Um, it does have some issues with oxidation, but because of the way we, we uh, do the manufacturing on it, it actually has a very low erosion or chemical erosion rate mm -hmm. during, uh, during operation. Um, we do have some materials like some of the other materials that we actually use are like a, a tungsten. Some, some uh, high performance uh, missiles actually use a tungsten throat, so it's a metallic throat. Um, it can't quite handle the really, really high temperatures, but it can handle temperatures up in the low 6,000 degree Fahrenheit range. Uh, wow. Some other materials that we worked with were some of the ceramics uh, like tantalum carbide, hafnium carbide, um, zirconium diboride, uh, zirconium carbides. Those types of systems actually were up in the, in the higher 6,000 degree range and they can hold up in there under various, some of them hold up better in oxidizing, some of them hold up better under uh, reducing environments. Mm -hmm. 
and just sort of what is and to to give Heath and that's an incredible answer Heath I hope you're satisfied there and I'm going to push him just a little bit further please you know what sort of what materials are out there that what, what's the maximum temperature resistance that we can achieve where that material isn't just melting or instantly ablating so again about so the 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 highest temperature melting material we know is actually a material called tannin carbide. Now I notice when I said melting, uh, cause carbon actually, um, it doesn't melt. It, it actually, uh, well, it doesn't even ablate. It actually sublimes at temperatures, uh, higher temperatures than even that, but we'll, we won't go there at this point, but as far as the actual materials that melt, it will be tannin carbide. And actually it's a, uh, a solid solution between tannin and hafnium carbide. Uh, it actually has a melting point just over 7,100 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in that ballpark. It's it's so hot that it's actually hard to measure, and it's hard to actually get an accurate number on it. So that's if you're talking about peak temperatures, that's it. You can go a little higher with uh, carbon, but you oh my, I think computer. We can again. still hear you when the when the computer goes to sleep, so don't worry. Okay, well <laughs> it, it, it's hard to talk to a black screen, um, but the, so the carbon actually. Um, the carbon you can use a little higher temperature, but the higher temperature you get, the more erosion you tend to get from it. From mm -hmm. a uh, uh, not just a, it's not a chemical, not always just a chemical erosion, but a physical erosion that occurs. Yeah, and that's you know at those kinds of high temperatures, it's um, part of my interest was in in nuclear and quantum, and so looking at those high high ends is uh, always fascinating. How mm -hmm. things literally and figuratively break down. Yeah. Um, We've got a question here from Puneet Batsetti. Will there be, um, you know, what are the sorts of concerns with airframe or structural damages to rockets when it's uh, undergoing max Q or is breaking the sound barrier or in those sorts of high dynamic stress uh, situations? Well, so the, actually the, that's one of the things that we, when we talked about the, um, computer code that we use to maximize performance. That was actually one of the big deals was the fact that we were trying to, my dogs just came in. Um, there, you wanna make sure that the, um, that the vehicle doesn't see undue um, exterior loads during that time. Cause you're actually, you're putting a lot of stress on the airframe. You're putting a lot of uh, issues on, um, on the overall and the avionics as far as the control system. So trying to uh, reduce the amount of thrust and the like that we have on the system um, is, is kind of key. That uh, optimization route that we went earlier actually had uh, <laughs> one of the, the design features dogs. was actually to, um, to try to maximize performance, but to minimize the effect inside of Max-Q. Mm. So we actually have, we design into the solid rocket motors what we call thrust bucket. So it actually, we have a really high thrust to get off the pad. And then as we come into max Q, we actually have the, the, the grain is set up. So we have a really low or not really low. It's still in SLS booster. It's about 2 million pounds of thrust at that point. Relatively that aspect, low. It's, it's, it's low compared to the three and a half million peak thrust. So the, uh, we reduce that thrust so that we're actually minimizing loads inside the vehicle while it's experiencing this max dynamic pressure on the outside of the vehicle. So, but then after we get through that stage, then everything starts to ramp back up and we, we pick the, uh, pick the accelerations back up. Gosh, I'm just getting this mental image of like an hourglass almost and just seeing it you know, bubble out and it's, um, man, that's really cool. Never would have, never would have guessed the, the advantages in doing that. Uh, and speaking of solid rocket propulsion, we've got another anonymous attendee. Um, come on folks, make sure you register with your names. Um, asking about the future of solid rocketry propulsion uh, in the uh, in the industry uh, and the future of solid rocket motors as we look out into the uh, the future of aerospace exploration uh, and not just uh, SLS and Artemis but looking to you know moving into cis lunar Mars and beyond. So there's probably always going to be some. Um market for solid rocket motors. Now, when you get into, when you start talking about uh, in-space propulsion, you're really starting to talk about using liquids or um, 
using your liquid propulsion, which is LOX hydrogen, uh, methane uh, LOX, something along those lines, or electric propulsion, some of the ion propulsion or some of those types of systems. Nuclear thermal has been having a lot of, uh, uh, getting a lot of press lately, nuclear electric, those types of systems are really more optimized, or, well, I shouldn't say for the liquids, but uh, especially the electric, the nuclear systems are really more optimized for in-space propulsion. Um, solid rockets are great for um, getting off the ground. They get a lot of thrust for, um, for the initial, not necessarily weight, but they give you a lot of thrust really quickly and they, you can store them for a long period of time. Um, one of the things that's actually come up that uh, was in the news recently was uh, the Mars sample return mission. It was actually uh, Perseverance that was sent to Mars is going to cache some samples. Now they're sending up a sample return vehicle in probably three or four years that actually has a solid rocket motor that they're going to, they're sending it all the way up there. It's going to sit there for a year. It's going to wait until it gets loaded and then they're going to lift it up and, and launch the solid. So having that capability of being in storage, dealing with cold temperatures, dealing with the stresses of the environment, but then still do exactly what you're expecting it to do is one advantage that solids have over, uh, over some of the other propulsion techniques. And so it'll probably ensure that the solids have a play or at least have some play within the, uh, within our space transportation network. Absolutely. And I mean, even thinking, you know, getting more sci-fi with it and thinking about humans in cis lunar space and, or, and in orbit, you know, if you're talking about lifeboats that you never want to use and that just have to sit there and always be ready, you know, what's better than the high impulse to get you away from something quickly that you also mm -hmm. know is going to stay stable. Right. Well, that's, and that's how we do, the, I mean, that's the whole purpose of the launch abort system on the top of SLS and mm -hmm. was on the top of um, the Apollo rocket was, is really, it's there, it's ready to go at a heartbeat. I mean, one of the things that I love to say on, on that video we saw of the SLS booster, it goes from nothing to three and a half million pounds of thrust in less than a second. So it is, it's ready to go, bam, you're, Get out you're of going somewhere. And so I, I don't know if you guys happened to see the um, AA2 launch uh, back in late 2019, where we actually sent a boilerplate Orion up and then launched the, or actually fired the launch abort system. But it was great to see that thing under thrust. And then all of a sudden the launch abort motor just kicks and it takes off. Mm -hmm. And so again, something that you that will sit there. If you don't need it, you throw it away. It's not a big deal. But when you do need it, it's there and can get, you, get the Ready job done quickly. So there's always going to be a future for solid rockets. Just a question of what are we using them for? Yes. Because of those inherent trade-offs that we all have to make mm -hmm. with, uh, with those design choices. Um, getting back into uh, thermal, uh, thermal questions uh, from Melissa Fredrickson. From a yeah. thermal standpoint, will aerospike no uh, nozzles ever be feasible? Well, actually, to be honest, aerospike nozzles have been tested and were ready for flight. Um, back e even back in the Apollo days, the uh, there was a it, look it up on the internet. It's it's out there. There are actually some videos out there. There was a thing called the J2T, and so they took the J2 engine that was on the upper stage of the Saturn rock Saturn V rocket and actually converted it into an aerospike nozzle. It worked great. There were it was actually. Uh, in line for upgraded versions of the Saturn V rocket. Um, the, if you go more recently, I can't remember the exact name of the rocket or the engine, but there was a, uh, an engine that was designed for a single stage to orbit system that NASA put together in the late 90s that was what was called a linear aerospike. And so that actually had, instead of being an annular aerospike where you have the little spike in the bottom, it was linear and kind of looked funky but they actually had that tested and were um they run into some issues some technical issues but it wasn't anything that was actually uh, a showstopper it just ended up being that the uh there were some other issues with the overall vehicle and with the uh, mass fraction they were able to take to orbit that uh kind of doomed the vehicle so i think that aerospikes are out there and there are People who are always uh, working on new versions of aerospikes. I actually worked on a version of a, uh, a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen aerospike about four years ago. We were looking at an annular aerospike and we got all the way to testing and we ended up having an issue not related to the rocket engine, which is 
goes back to that interpersonal thing. Uh, we actually had an issue with the with the company we were dealing with, and they had some internal lawsuits go on because of intellectual properties. We then ended up scuttling the whole project. But again, the Aerospike actually it really solved some issues with regards to uh, packaging for in space engines. You normally have to have this really long nozzle to get the uh, ISP figures that you need. With the Aerospike, you're able to actually compress that down, so you're actually able to shorten the inner stage up, actually reduce the mass necessary on the rocket and get really good performance. So it has a lot of inherent uh, advantages. It has some issues with regards to how do you make it work? How do you get the, um, how do you design the structures to actually get the to, so the aerospike sits there and actually be able to perform appropriately um, within the rocket. So there, there are trade-offs. I, I just think it's one of those that when people see it on conceptual designs, it looks weird. So therefore it must be wrong. I mean, that's they, the get, they, get, get, they get freaked out. Wait, hang yeah. on. This well, isn't what I think a rocket ship looks like. Well, no, not no, to no, mention, no. I mean, a lot of engineers, when you get into something, you'll look at something and you're like, that's weird. Something's wrong. And so that's the, 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 it kicks off. And so if it's not what you're used to seeing, it takes a little bit more work to actually convince yourself that that's something that's right. So and, I do think aerospikes are going to work. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's it's not that aerospikes aren't feasible. It's that just waiting for that right moment where yeah. the engineers are excited about it, find a way to use it. The business development folks see it and are, and, and don't get afraid. <laughs> and that there is the moment to rise to it of saying, this is the perfect solution. So I, w I will say that there are a couple applications where aerospikes have been used and most of them are on smaller rockets. And there was actually... I know of at least one instance where an aerospike nozzle was used on a defense application. Um, it was, it was a, it's a really small motor. It was used, but uh, so it, it's out there and it's still kicking around and there's still opportunities for it to, uh, to move into the mainstream. Awesome. And we're getting a lot of questions here about different sorts of substances or fuels or propulsion methods and, and asking questions about, you know, what's the, you know, what's the most popular thing right now? What's the most, you know, the most, the go-to solution right now for the missions we're running? And then, you know, what is what most people are looking to for the future of propulsion We'll split that into two questions, getting into orbit and then when you're in orbit. Okay. So there are actually a, a, a number. It depends on the, it depends on the company, to be honest. Um, some companies um, have taken an approach of optimizing your system for, uh, for the relevant environment. So using like the, the Atlas launcher actually uses uh, kerosene, oxygen for its first stage propellants with solid boosters wrapped around the outside. And then for the second stage, it uses hydrogen oxygen uh, for fuel to, to get better performance because you want the better, you want the higher performing engine on the, on the, the higher stages. So better ISP and the closer you get to space. Um, the other companies um, are using different techniques. I mean, ULA also uses the, the new Vulcan system uses methane and oxygen for its uh, first stage. And then also with solid boosters and then hydrogen oxygen for the upper stage. SpaceX uses kerosene oxygen for both stages for simplicity purposes. They don't have to have additional uh, fuel systems plumbed into the launch pad to fuel the different stages. They can just use one fuel both stages off you go. So they have some trade-offs because of that, because the, uh, kerosene oxygen systems are not as efficient in space as they as like a hydrogen oxygen system or even a methane oxygen system. Um, so some of the Blue Origin is using something similar to ULA where they're using a methane oxygen system on their low, lower stages, uh, oxygen, hydrogen on the upper stage. Um, and I, I, I don't want to point fingers, but Northrop Grumman actually, or we launch um, payloads to the space station on the Antares rocket. And we go went a completely different route with that one. So we use uh, kerosene oxygen for the lower stage, but then use a solid for the upper stage. And so it seems kind of it seems kind of awkward, but it was it was one of those situations where it wasn't the optimal solution, but it was a solution that was existent and that they could use relatively quickly. 
because we came in late into the program where uh, there was a company called Kistler that was actually designing a uh, cargo delivery system to ISS and they uh, they pulled out of the comp- or pulled out of their contract <laughs> midway through orbital came in and said at, at the time it was orbital sciences now Northrop Grumman came in and said hey we've got a rocket we think we can put together that will do the same type of job and it really was more of a hey what have we got that we can put together and actually get this job done and get it done right and it works and it works very well but it's not what you would consider the optimal system and so that's that's where um, uh, it really is a trade-off on how you want to do things. There are some solid, there's some systems that are all solid using four five, six stages to get to orbit. It really depends on what you want to do. Now, once you get into orbit, once you get into space, now you've got all sorts of different, uh, uh, techniques that open up to you. Most systems, you'll get a lot of people that will use hydrogen oxygen just because it's a very efficient system. You also get a lot of, um, uh, the shuttle actually used hydrazine. Uh, so relatively simple. It's a, it's a hypergolic system. You don't need to worry about starting it up. You just put the liquids together. They catch on fire, actually explode. Um, but, uh, you control an explosion. That's an engine. Um, so that was one of the techniques they used. Um, some of the new systems that they're putting up into, uh, into orbit are actually electric power. So a lot of the geosynchronous satellites are now going to electric systems because you need a lot less fuel. So you can, you can put them up there. Well, even even actually transferring from um, their transfer orbit, going from low Earth orbit up to geosynchronous orbit, they use an electric thruster to actually get into that uh, geosynchronous orbit. So it's a it it does help a lot with the station keeping. It reduces the amount of fuel, which reduces the size of the satellite, which reduces the uh, size of the launch vehicle you need. Um, one of the systems that they're using uh, sometimes they'll use a solid kick stage in orbit where they'll have a solid motor that'll be sitting there and it'll wait for the appropriate time, kick it, it'll it'll work, run for the 30 to 90 seconds, depending on the size of the motor and get it off to uh, where it needs to go. So um, New Horizons, the one, the mission that visited Pluto a few years ago, actually launched on an Atlas V. After the, uh, the upper stage burned out, it had a, a solid kick stage to give it more acceleration as it went out to Pluto. So again, it really depends on the situation. Uh, NASA is actually investigating what they call nuclear thermal system, where they use a nuclear reactor to heat up hydrogen. So you just dump liquid hydrogen into the into this nuclear reactor. It gets it heats it up from liquid hydrogen temperatures to, depending on the on the setup of the reactor, somewhere between 25 and 2700 degrees, potentially 2900 degrees Kelvin, and heats it up. You get this hot gas that comes out the rear end. You put it through a nozzle. And now you got an engine. That's so, exhaust. Absolutely. And so, but that actually has a really big benefit in that it has higher ISP than hydrogen oxygen, but you can also have a high thrust with it. You can do it, you can make it a 25, 30,000 pound thrust engine with the nuclear system. Electric systems, you're limited to, most of the time you're limited to a couple newtons, which is, think of a newton, think about a piece of paper laying on your hand. That's the amount of thrust that a newton is. So it's basically use that for years and you'll go really fast. But if you want to just get somewhere, if you want a quick impulse, you need to use some other techniques. So there are also other uh, experimental techniques out there. There's some people using uh, direct fusion drives where they're actually looking at doing uh, deuterium hydrogen fusion in a confined area and actually using that, using the exhaust products from that, the helium and the light that get kicked off of that as your thrust elements. So those are more in experimental designs, but they're still there. So it really depends on how far out in the future you want to go. How I don't want to say pie in the sky, but really how uh, how experimental you want to go. Yeah, how far you want to look into the future, and then, mm-hmm. like you had said earlier, all of these different things are trade offs, and so yeah. it's not that solid rocket motors are ever going to be obsolete, or liquid fuel was ever going to be you know entirely obsolete, or that you know that nuclear isn't feasible, or that aerospike engines just we haven't found a way to it's not that any of these things are bad choices it's that you have to find the right choice for the situation in front of you and all of those Mm -hmm. conditions absolutely it's all a trade-off it's all design it's all a design solution that you come up with based on the uh the initial conditions that you're given by your customer all right (laughs) shifting gears here to talk about aerospace careers um, we've got a question from Danica Lee. Uh, she asks, 
in your experience, uh, in what ways does a career in aerospace gain or maybe lose value over time, talking personally and professionally? So sort of asking, how does a career in aerospace develop and what is it like working in an industry that has, you know, if you think about the last, well, if you think about the last century, the aerospace industry was just born. And so how, how much has changed between the birth of the industry, the 1960s, the height of the space race, then getting into now, you know, how, um, in what ways does an aerospace career sort of change over time? Speaking to somebody who has had a good chunk of experience in the industry. Well, to be honest, uh, I have to say one thing that's gotten better in the industry is work-life balance. Um, when I started and even before that, it was really um, focused on you, you did your job and that was really, everything else was secondary. It was really about getting the, getting the mission. And over time, people have realized that that leads to, it really leads to burnout of your engineers. You, you end up with people who um, aren't so happy and you tend to have issues. So one of the things that we have noticed, uh, that I've noticed over the time is actually a more emphasis on making sure that there is a balance between what you do at work and what you do off work, just so that your um, what happens at home has an impact on how you work. So we wanna make sure that people are, are happy in both places, not just uh, fulfilling at work. Um, the other thing that's came into, that's really come into play is just the, uh, the explosion of digital. Um, the digital revolution is really, even from the time in the past 15 years, it's been a huge change in how things are done. When I started, um, when you manufactured something, there was shop travelers, there was a piece of paper that went with it. Um, we actually were issued stamps. So when you did something, you had your stamp that had your number on it. You stamped it to say, yes, I did it. And I sign off that it's okay. Where nowadays um, we have, basically they get up, it's on a, it's on a computer it's tabbed to the right screen. The guy t picks up a bars code reader, scans his, his uh, work badge, and that's his uh, that's his stamp. So we've really made a lot of progress in in how we actually do those things. Inspections. Uh, we now have these. Uh, we have augmented reality goggles that they use to. They actually guys will put them on and actually be able to see an outline of the system overlaid on the parts that they're working on so that they can see, oh, okay, this part goes here and you can actually use those. Um, we have um, uh, laser tracing of outlines for um, parts that are actually, so if we wanna, if we have specific um, direction about where to cut something, they'll actually be able to place a laser outline of the, uh, the part up there, the area you need to cut. And so you can, they can actually trim based on that laser outline. So a lot of the, what we used to take for, it used to be a lot more and i hate to say skilled but it was a lot more uh hand Art. and uh finesse where now a lot more of that is it we try to take as much of that out as we can so that it's more it's a more repeatable system it's easier to understand it's not as much an art, it's more of a, yeah. uh, a manufacturing science. You don't have to be a great sculptor with modeling clay to, mm -hmm. to show us your design. Just work yes. it up in CAD and we'll, yes. we'll all put on the goggles and take a look. Mm -hmm. yep. um, oh, that's really mm -hmm. tremendous. And uh, Stephen from Kamas High School, I think that also covers your question of how has the space industry changed since you first got into it? Is there anything you'd like to add on to that? Uh, from well, I a broader perspective, I, I think that's the big one. Um, <laughs> the one thing it, the one thing has changed that you might not necessarily it's not necessarily technical, but the politics around space has kind of changed. So it's become a lot it's a lot different industry now than it was when I started. So there's a lot more commercial players involved. There's a lot more. Um, and I, I don't want it, it's not really an us against them. It's, I mean, it's a collective work, but it's a much more competitive environment than it was maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, so that's a good thing because that actually drives everybody to uh, more efficient, better, better solutions. And, it's the whole idea. Yep. And so it, that in itself of itself has been a, it's been a major change. It's just seeing the proliferation of different, uh, different players in the marketplace. Mm hmm. And different, uh, and you know everything that we've talked about today with design, it's about all of those different approaches. And so, mm -hmm. 
all of these different companies are giving different approaches. Do you want to use, you know, do you want to use hydrazine? Do you want to use liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen? How do you want to do it? How do you want to approach these solutions? And um, yeah, oh, I think that's really, really interesting there with those dynamics. Uh, and speaking of how things have changed, uh, we've gotten a couple questions from both Stephen Wu and Joshua Curtis about 3D printing. Uh, and how 3D printing additive manufacturing uh, is changing the, pro the programs that you work on and uh, how that's getting applied to, I don't know, maybe a little, little rocket called SLS. Well, you know, the, the funny thing about, I, I love talking about additive manufacturing because um, it's always seemed to be the new thing. I mean, it, the funny thing is, is when I graduated college, now that's way, way back, <laughs> additive manufacturing was there. We were actually doing, we were actually doing work on metallic and ceramic. Uh, was that med uh, metal, metal powder centering? Metal powder centering we did. There was another process called lens where it was, uh, I can't remember the exact acronym, but it was, it was a laser, it was a laser centering process. We we're actually available in the early nineties and they've always been kind of working. It's only until, it's only been in the last probably five, 10 years where the, um, the material science and computing power have caught up to the promise. So now we're getting to the point where you can actually, you can actually lay down large scale parts. It used to be that um, added manufacturing was really small, small scale parts. Now we're getting to the point where they've developed the techniques to actually produce really large things. Uh, we actually looked at the, uh, we've got a, we developed a new booster for the Atlas and the Vulcan systems of called our Gem 63. And one of the things we actually looked at in the rear of the, uh, the motor, there's actually a really large metallic structure. Originally made of titanium, now we're making it out of steel. We looked at, can we make this out of ma uh, additive manufacturing? Because the, to get it made normally was a part that was gonna take, it was 12 to 18 month lead time to get the part. Oh so, yeah, all the different joinings and... Well, no, it's just to get the forging. So <laughs> it would, the, just to manufacture the, the metal was taking that long because it was such a backlog Gosh. and it was such a specialty part. So we actually looked at additive manufacturing. Can we make it? Now at the time, the the additive manufacturing cells weren't quite big enough to make a 63 inch diameter part. So we decided to go just the standard route and just order ahead. But some of the smaller systems we're producing actually makes a lot of sense to start going that route because again, you're reducing your lead time and the costs really aren't that different. So it's actually helping out a lot. One of the other things we're actually using additive manufacturing in uh, uh, on flight hardware right now is the ISS uh, cargo delivery. We actually use a lot of additive manufacturing in the Antares rocket, where a lot of the uh, a lot of parts within the system. Now they may not necessarily be what you would call structural parts, but a lot of the little specialty connectors and the like that we use to to run our cabling, to run wiring, are actually additive manufactured because we can now contour those to the specific shape they need for the specific part that they're put in, as opposed to trying to take a generic part and make it fit and have mm. spacers and like added to it to get them to work. So it's actually very, very effective from that standpoint. And it's actually revolutionized a lot of what we do, uh, trying to figure out, uh, and actually one of the big initiatives within, uh, within the aerospace in general is actually how to better utilize additive manufacturing to reduce uh, manufacturing time, to reduce costs, and to, to do, there were some things. So in the Aerospike engine that we talked about earlier that I was working on, we actually made some of the, uh, the thrust chambers additive manufactured. We were actually able to make parts that we couldn't make otherwise, just because that technique opened up a design space that otherwise wasn't available from a standard subtractive uh, manufacturing mm. process. All right. And so it's both improvements, not just on these these novel designs that are possible through these different techniques for additive manufacturing, 3D printing, but also that huge, the difference it makes in logistics, you know, not mm -hmm. having to wait nearly as long for something right. special to roll off a truck or get land on the runway and get unloaded. Mm -hmm. Oh, so we're getting to the end of our time here. So we'll have two questions um, that are coming from our advanced pool that I wanted to make sure that we get to. Uh, okay. One of them was, uh, one of them is, was there a particular class or activity that you did in high school or college that really had a huge impact on you and was what 
pushed you into engineering and made a difference in your career? To be honest, it was actually, um, it probably would have been in high school in my um, physics and chemistry classes, just getting into those and actually making the realization that, hey, I really like these hard sciences. These are, this is something I want to do. How do I utilize this? Uh, I tell my kids a story that um, I was always a space nut and I wanted to be an astronomer. I thought it was going to be great. Um, but when I went to the guidance counselor to look up astronomy and what the, what kind of jobs were available, they were like, well, the only time really an astronomy job is available is when an astronomer dies. And so it was kind of like, well, maybe that's not the best op opportunity for a job. So as I started thinking about, okay, using hard sciences, using these things, and also I, I like to tinker. I mean, I like to play around and tear things apart, put them back together. And it was kind of, the engineering fit was kind of obvious. So it really, between those, the chemistry and the physics class, and then just kind of realizing that it really was a, a fit with my personality type, that's really kind of what got me going. And then going into college and actually getting into some of the engineering classes and going, yeah, no, this is the, this is really what uh, it, it really strikes my interest. It really is something that pulls me and just kind of all put downhill from there. <laughs> downhill or uh, one could say up into orbit absolutely <laughs> uh and speaking of going into orbit uh we'll close with this question what advice would you have for a high schooler today that wants to work on programs taking us to mars i would say just go for it um i mean make sure that you're taking the uh the classes that you that you know you're going to need in engineering do your math um, do your sciences. Those are going to be the, the pieces, parts that you're going to have to, those are the basis of everything you're going to do. I mean, if you don't have your math, you don't have your uh, sciences, you're not going to make it very far in engineering. However, the other thing I would tell you to do is don't neglect the, uh, the soft stuff. Don't neglect the, um, the writing uh, side of it. Most of what we do in engineering is actually uh, I don't want to say giving presentations because that really, it, but that's really what it is, is about communicating your ideas. If you can't communicate your ideas to somebody or communicate your, uh, your design techniques, you're not going to be able to, to win anybody over. So you've got to know the basis of your math and your science, but you also have to be able to accurately convey that and be able to do it succinctly and be able to do it without, um, without irritating or putting everybody to sleep. You really do need to, it, you need to have a little bit of a combination of, uh, of both sides of the, uh, of that to be able to come off. I mean, we've, uh, we actually, I was at a, uh, the small sack conference up here in Logan, Utah, and we had a, a college, a couple college people come in and interview for a job. And one of them was so, they weren't necessarily the best candidate. I mean, their grade point wasn't, it wasn't a 4.0, they were, they were low threes, um, the resume, eh, it was okay, but it wasn't like, it wasn't one of those that was spectacular, but talking to the person, the, the passion that you could, you could, they could convey and their ability to convey their excitement and to be able to talk about what they've done and what they would like to do was enough to win over. And they actually got a job offer on the spot. So it was, it was one of those things that it's not necessarily that you get perfect grades. It's that you have good grades you have good experience out there and that you are able to, to handle yourself well in front of a person and actually be able to convey your thoughts and your ideas. Those are the things I would tell you to be able to do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. This has been a really tremendous evening and we've gotten lots and lots of questions uh, that, we, uh, that we didn't have the chance to get to. Uh, a lot of you all getting really hard into there with some of the sci-fi concepts of Mar of, uh, of going in deep space exploration and, and, and Mars colonization. Um, but I'd like to thank Mike, you for coming on and uh, being here tonight. And then a huge thank you also to everyone who joined us in the audience. And of course, again, thanks to Northrop Grumman uh, for being the host for tonight's webinar. Hey, thanks for letting, uh, letting me come on and thanks for the questions. It was a lot of fun. And if there's an opportunity for to pass some of those questions on and answer them via email, I'd love to uh, be able to help you out with those as well. But thanks for having me on and uh, being willing to, to listen to me and uh, ask some really good questions, to be honest. It was, it was a lot of fun. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone. And 
we look forward to hosting another Ask an Engineer webinar soon. So stay tuned and good luck with all of your launches. Take care. Thanks, everybody.